introduce uh, Jenny Steibolt and enjoy the program. Well, th thank you so much, and, and thanks for inviting me to, uh, to speak to you. Um, so what, what I, what, what, what changed the way I garden was joining the Native Plant Society because when I came to Florida in 2004, I was, I was flummoxed by Florida gardening and, and, um, but learning that natives were important changed my whole viewpoint. So here are three books that uh, I've written that deal with, with native gardening and the, I wrote Sustainable Gardening for Florida as my first book and that covered a whole range of materials including natives and non-natives and all kinds of stuff. But after joining the Native Plant Society, I found that quite often people overpromise how easy natives will be. So the art of maintaining a Florida native landscape was uh, in answer to that, that no, I mean, if it's in your yard, your yard is not a wild space. And so the, this was, how can you reduce your maintenance and how can you plan for maintenance? And more recently, I co-wrote with Marjorie uh, Shropshire, who is my illustrator and co-author. We did a step-by-step -step to a Florida native yard in answer to uh, Doug Tallamy, uh question that somebody asked him and he was presenting in Florida and a woman said well I have a small Florida yard and how do I get started so that's where that book came from so I'll be talking a little bit about um, why natives are important how to get started and how to plan ahead and I have this meme that I created this uh, gallery of red, white, and blue photos um, trying to change the narrative on natives and that it's not strange that these are all American native plants. And so I often post this on uh, the 4th of July um, just to get people thinking about what belongs here. Now we have been programmed as gardeners uh, we have been programmed to have formal gardens, and th this is based on um, formal gardens in the in the British Isles and in Europe. And having a formal garden like this, and this is Belfast Castle in Ireland, uh, having a formal garden like this shows how wealthy you are. And now it's not a personal castle anymore; it's a public. Uh, space and the day that we were there they were going to run ha a wedding there but the garden itself is a very high maintenance garden and we are supposed to take this as an example and put it in our yards and we are often given choices like this at a, at a big box store so you've got a whole bunch of relatively inexpensive flowers in full bloom and then you plant them in your yard um, and then as soon as you do they may grow some but as a botanist I can tell you that these plants have fulfilled their life plan they have grown they have germinated and grown and produced flowers and seeds and it's and when you take them home they may or may not live for very long and so then in a few months you replace them with something else and and so this is good good business model for the people who are growing these flowers but it's it's not a good business plan for you as a gardener, and it's not good for for our birds and our and our pollinators because almost all of these are not native. All right, and then even worse, there are a lot of invasive plants that are now for sale, um, like the Nandina domestica, and it's been shown more than once that this kills. Uh, birds like the cedar waxwings that are migrating birds and they gorge on berries. Um, they they gorge on berries and, and the, the, there's substances in there that have killed them. So 
the other thing that we are program to want is instant landscaping. And so if you watch TV and stuff, the people come in, the experts come in, they plant all the plants and and then they then they go away and, and it's an occasion. But th this was in my neighborhood. And so they brought in three truckloads full of soil to build a privacy, semi-privacy berm in the front of their yard. And then they planted all these plants that none of them were native. They moved the sago palm up to the top of the hill um, and none of them were native. And the, the plants lasted for a little while, but then the rainy season came and they hadn't figured out that putting all that dirt in the front of their house was going to mean that when it, when the rains came that that was going to flood their kitchen so they had to take out all the all the soil um so and and then they put in the next the next landscape and then now they're on another one so but landscaping is not an event it's an ongoing process now, Doug Tallamy changed the way we think about native landscapes. And as we, we were talking about earlier um, before the program, he's an entomologist at the University of Delaware. And he said that our plants need to be more than just pretty. They've got to play a role in the ecosystems. And he has spoken over and over again. He's been a prolific speaker. I've, I've been to three of his talks here in Florida, and, and I took the, this photo at, at an FNPS conference a few years ago. So he has changed the way we think about the natives. And he, he did um, his study on chickadees. Of course, we don't have chickadees in Florida, but that each pair needs six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one clutch of young. And where are those caterpillars going to feed? They're going to feed on native plants and mostly trees. And so it's an important part of a bird-friendly yard to have places where caterpillars can exist. So we need to pay attention to the larval food sources. And now Tallamy has a homegrown national park. And so he wants you to replace at least half of your lawn with native habitat and then you register your yard to become part of this park and this park would be all over the um the country and would be much larger than any of our other national parks and so um i i i am not on the map yet but it's something that i'm intending to do uh soon because i have replaced most of the lawn that was in our landscape so you can go to homegrownnationalpark.org so the native landscapes you would want less lawn and the remaining lawn would be more sustainably managed and this reduces maintenance costs both time and money and it reduces irrigation needs and you should stop all landscape wide applications of anything so no insecticides no and fungicides, no herbicides, no synthetic fertilizer, all, all landscape-wide uh, applications usually put on by lawn service companies. So this, the, this stuff that people put on their lawns runs off into the water. And so the algae blooms and um, happen. And so we can save money and we can also improve the landscape and we can also make our yards friendlier to the insects and friendlier to the birds. And so we just need to say no to these applications because mother nature's predators are much more effective. And I love this sign, it says, no pesticides. I love my family and the environment more than my lawn. So we need to have a balanced ecosystem in our yards. So the native landscapes are beautiful and we need to help people see that they are beautiful. So if you have 
a native landscape, and I'll get to this in a minute, you need to help people see that you've done this on purpose, that this is not a bunch of weeds. So we need to feed the birds and we need to feed the pollinators. Um, and both of those happen with natives. And there are a number of ways to feed birds. So here we've got a coral honeysuckle and the coral honeysuckle will feed the hummingbirds. The hummingbirds love it. But then you've got the berries and the cardinals and the other berry eating um, birds would like that. You need bunching grasses with lots of seeds the small birds like. You've got here is a tropical sage, which is a native and it's it, blooms pretty much all year round, even up here in North Florida. And again, the hummingbirds like it, but also the butterflies and a whole bunch of other things. And here is a um, the waxy berries of the wax myrtle. And so the wax myrtle is a wonderful um, bush, shrub, small tree to put in your yard. It's native to most of Florida. And it's an interesting plant because it actually can grow in wet soil, dry soil, and poor soil in its roots. It fixes nitrogen like the uh, bean family does so that it can, it can grow in really, really awful soil. And also in our landscapes, we need to leave the snags because the birds really enjoy the snags. So how do you go native? Well, the Native Plant Society in Florida, we're very fortunate. We have a wonderful society. And you can choose natives for your county using the tool on the FNPS website. So if you say fnps.org slash plants, then you can say I'm in Orange County and I want uh pollinator plants or I want trees or whatever, and it'll give you a list of plants that are native to your county. Also here in Florida, we are very fortunate that we have the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. And you can go to plantrealflorida.org to find a nearby nursery um, or to find a plant that you want. So you can put in that you want tropical sage or whatever. and I highly urge you to join your local chapter so that we can all help make native landscaping the new normal in Florida. And here is a, a plant sale at a Native Plant Society um, annual conference. Uh, I will give you some inside information on that. The conferences are not are go going to probably be semi-annual from now on. Um, so in between, there will be regional events and the, the statewide conference will be uh, every other year. Okay, so in our book, um, because Marjorie is an artist, um, we took a very visual, a very visual uh, take on a yard. So it's about a third of an acre. And here's what it would be finished. And that's on the cover is the finished yard. But we start out with, okay, so here is your here is your landscape. And here is your pollinator garden. So you might want to put the pollinator gardens in first. But before you do anything, you need to know where all your pipes are. <laughs> you know, you need to figure out where the water is going when it rains. Do you need to put in rain gardens to absorb more water um, so that you would be able to plan, plan for this? So we covered all of this in the book, looking, I think, from an interesting point of view, sort of down at an angle. Um, so that you can visual, you can see both the front and the backyards, but you get some uh, perspective rather than having it just from the top. I think it's an interesting angle to look from. All right, so you want to determine your the flow of the of the stormwater. So what happens when it rains? Where does the stormwater go? 
is it piped out to the storm drains and you know maybe you could put in a, a rain barrel or two um to save some of that water or sequester some of that water and maybe you can put in a rain garden where the water can settle in and refurb restore our, our aquifer um and on the roadside swales this is in my neighborhood um there have roadside swales don't fill these in you know let the let the water collect in these swales um and if you are allowed now most of the time the county has the right of way on the swales and they may have rules as to what you can and cannot plant but there may be um sedges uh or rushes that you could plant this is a white top sedge that would be very happy in the center of this and would not need to be mowed but it could be could be mowed once a year but it would absorb water much better than tended turf grass also in florida and and in a lot of other places a single tree plopped in the middle of the yard seems to be the default landscape i took this photo in the villages um and oh by, and by the way the villages has a very active native plant society uh chapter and uh, they they are working to um get more people to have native plants in their yard but here's what's wrong with this so the magnolia here is a native plant but it drops its darn leathery leaves all year round so it makes a mess also they've built up gravel around it so you really don't want that at all you want to leave the root flare above the soil level so you never want to fill in a tree like that and those and those gra gravel those little stones can be caught with the uh, mowers and be you know break a window or something so if you end if you have a yard with a single tree what we suggested was building a grove around the tree and this is going to be better for the tree than lawn right up next to it and it's going to provide habitat for your birds and it's going to provide a more wind tolerant and more drought tolerant situation where the soil because you've planted other trees and shrubs around that lone tree then this becomes a whole habitat now to make it easy to mow you have rounded corners no vertical edges and so the whoever is doing the mowing on the rest of the lawn there can just make a clean sweep and never has to come back with a string trimmer so this way you're not taking over a whole landscape you're just building a grove around that lone tree so a lot of times people take this as the first step in their nativizing um, so that they can get started at building habitat and it's better for the tree and you're reducing the lawn and you're putting in all natives and this is sunshine mimosa not mimosa tree which is an invasive so and the, what you plant around it would be need similar soil to the magnolia so the magnolia likes acidic soil so what we chose here were some um shrubs that also liked acidic soil and bunching grasses should be used much more than they are um, as a landscape feature all right so when selecting a tree and here's the magnolia again i took this at a big box store don't buy this tree it's been topped right here see this it's been topped and so there are three headers now maybe four if you include this one it's been in the in a container for too long it's about three uh three inches in diameter at six inches above the above the root flare 
it's pot bound. The roots are going to be going around and around. And it costs a lot of money. And because it's so large and because it's been kept in a container for so long, then it's the chances of it actually uh, adjusting to a new location uh, are not that great. Now, if you're buying container-grown trees, you need to rinse the roots. And this is against all of the other advice that you have ever gotten, but this has been shown by Linda Chalker Scott, and her website is informedgardener.com. And what you want is to get rid of all that rich growing medium from the tree from the tree's roots. You want to straighten out those roots and you want to have bare, a bare root being planted. Because what you want is for the roots to, go, to spread out. You want them to spread out. And if you have that rich container soil in the roots, the roots are going to continue growing in that over rich medium probably you've got fertilizer balls and all kinds of, of fertilizers that have been put in there to keep the damn tree alive all right and then the tr the tree is eventually if you leave the coiling roots it's going to choke itself so this is tough love it's tough on the tree so you're going to have to irrigate for some time to get it used to it. Now, you don't want to prune the tree either because the tree needs energy. And where does it get the energy from? It gets the energy from its leaves. And so the old advice of chopping off half of the tree so it doesn't have so much to support is exactly the wrong thing to do. So if you need to prune to have a better shape or whatever wait at least a year before you do any pruning build a berm around the the planting hole so that when you are watering that the water stays in the planting hole do not put any amendments in the planting hole no compost no peat moss no fertilizers nothing you just want the tree to become used to the lousy soil that we have here in Florida. So it, this is harsh, but this way the tree has a better chance of making it. And when I do this presentation in person, people yell at me. They said, no, I've been planting trees for years and years. They, bear, they are fine. And they probably thought these were fine too. This is in uh, Oregon. These are copper beaches. And if you look at the roots here, they left them in the in the basket. And they probably did so because these copper beaches are large trees and they're put in too narrow a spot. And so the planters were probably instructed not to not to take the cage or the 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 plastic string off of the roots. So the roots have coiled around and around and have choked itself. So this is why you rinse the roots. You don't want this to happen. And, th and they should have chosen some shrubs or bunching grasses to grow here instead of the copper beaches. But the person who planted this tree probably thought he did a really good job because look how big they are and look how beautiful they are until they're not. So this is why you want to rinse the roots. You want to find the root flare, correct circling roots. You may even have to cut a root or two, and you want to get rid of all the non-native soil. That is why. So it's a new way of doing things, but that way you'll have a better chance of success. All right, so soil building. If you're, run, if you're growing vegetables, you want the richest soil possible. But if you're growing natives, you don't. All right. So you would never put compost or any enrichments in the planting hole. And if the native habitat is nutrient poor, like most of them are, you would not do any or very little soil building. Um, but if you're planting something... You could, after it's established, put a ring of compost around the planting hole. Don't dig it in. You could put mulch on it 
uh, and by the way, mulch does not touch the trunks of trees. Um, and it will enrich the soil. And if you do that around a tree that you've planted, then the richer soil is outside the planting hole. So you are then enticing the roots to grow outward um, instead of winding around in the hole. This is actually a, a sable minor palm. So it's not, it's related to our cabbage palm, but it's not as large. And I, I took this photo oh, probably 16 or 17 years ago. And now this sable miner is really large. I mean, for for this this species, it, it's grown very well. So I guess that it liked the compost that I put around it. Okay, and the other thing that Marjorie and I wanted to talk about was shrubs. And not as foundation plants because most shrubs are terrible as foundation plants they grow too big they have woody roots they could disturb the the um slab uh under there if it, if they're big enough and they're just not reasonable to put shrubs that are going to grow too big around the foundation <clears throat> There's a house that's newly for sale in our neighborhood. <laughs> and they, the um, the people who were preparing the house before it went on sale plopped in a whole bunch of little tiny uh, shrubs along the foundation, which is ridiculous. But what you want is the shrubs around trees. You want them as um, you know, privacy borders. Uh, you want you want them to fill in and many of the shrubs have lots of berries um, and flowers for for the birds so you would choose them so that they suited your your needs and while there are lots and lots of hedges in florida we should have more hedge rows now i'm not i'm pretty sure you can't grow the uh, oak leaf hydrangea where you are but it's a lovely shrub and it's beautiful for part of the year and then you would choose other shrubs that are beautiful in other parts but these these shrubs in a hedgerow would be planted far enough apart so that they could grow into their own individual shape and so that you would not need to prune them nearly as much as you would a a hedge that is trimmed to a fairly well so I'd love to see more hedgerows in Florida. And this is at the University of North Florida. And what I liked about this is that back here is wild. Not, not, nothing is being done back here. It's just a wild space. But what they have done is they've created a civilized border. So we've got some redbud trees. We've got some yopon hollies. And so the person doing the mowing on the lawn part just goes right along. There's nothing to come back and trim later. Uh, and while I wouldn't recommend red mulch like this, um, it does make a civilized border. And that, and when you have native uh, landscape, having a civilized border shows your neighbors that what you're doing is on purpose. Whoop. Yeah, freedom lawns. Okay, so we talked before about, I talked before about stopping all landscape-wide treatments. So what happens when you do that is that you end up with a freedom lawn. It's free from fertilizer, free from insecticide, free from fungicides, free from herbicides. So it's going to be filled with plants that are not grass. So when we moved in, this is my front yard, when we moved in, the the people who did the yard work before for the previous owners said, okay, we'll just continue treatment. I said, no. And they said, well, if we don't tend it, it's going to die. I said, okay. Um, and part, part of the lawn didn't do well. So I took out a whole part here and put in the natives over here, and I put in a mulch path where it was too shady and there was too much traffic along the side of the house. So it, I took out that part of the lawn. 
Um, but if you look at the lawn itself, it's filled with other kinds of plants. Here's a St. John's wort. It's a, it's a shrub. So oftentimes I dig these out if I want them. I've got rain lilies. I've got asters. I've got toad flax. I've got other plants. I've got um, frog fruit. I've got all kinds of different plants, probably 50 to 100 different kinds of plants that grow in my lawn. Now, the lawn is only about half of what it was, but and there's still some St. Augustine in there. But it's a bunch of other kind of kinds of things. So what what I liked is that a freedom lawn is at least a label so that somebody says, oh, your lawn is filled with all kinds of stuff. Oh, yes, my lawn's a freedom lawn. <laughs> it's, it's good to have a label. All right. Back, and this is in 2005, I think. That this tree here we lost in a hurricane in 2004. Yeah, we moved to Florida in 2004. We had four hurricanes that year. So I called this the Shady Triangle. So there's some couple of sweet gum trees over here. It was a bigger tree that we lost during the hurricane. And I decided that I would just take this out of the lawn. And over here, we've got our septic tank mound. And what we have is a meadow on top of that that gets mowed a couple of times a year. And that's it. So most of the time, it's a meadow. All right, so um, in a few years, it ended up looking like that. I had planted both a uh, magnolia grandiflora, a southern maple, a southern magnolia, and a sweet bay magnolia next to each other. I planted some bunching grasses. The goldenrod planted itself um, and by the way, goldenrod does not cause allergies. It's insect pollinated. Its pollen is too heavy to travel in the air. You will never end up getting hay fever from goldenrod. Um, so a lot of this volunteered. Here are the sweet gum trees that were there before that were much thinner back then. And again, here is the meadow on the septic tank mound. And then more recently, here it is again. So the magnolia trees are much larger. I've got my fakahatchee grass here. I've got ferns that have volunteered and uh, some grapevines and some other stuff. Um, so it, it's, it ends up now being a natural area where it was lawn before. And again, here is the meadow on top of the septic tank mound. All right. So when you have a lawn, a mowed part, the edges are the part that is most noticeable when you have a wild part. Okay, I wrote a whole article on, on this, on this uh, area, this is our front meadow, and it used to be St. Augustine. They had it all St. Augustine out here. So. Um, I have a whole thing, a, a retro, retrospective from lawn to woods. But what you want to think about is the edge. So again, we want a nice, round, smooth, clean edge, no vertical surfaces. So when my husband mows the lawn on the, with the, his rider mower, he, he just goes right around. That's it. He doesn't have to come back and trim. He doesn't have to G and haw. And there is a path here in the woods along a pond. Um, and again, I have a whole article on how this was developed. It was a meadow at first, but then we stopped taking out the trees and then it became a woods. <laughs> but still, and I've been taking out more lawn. So there's beautyberry here. And now I, the lawn is another four feet of it is gone at this point. So you want to reduce the edges. You want to make them easy to mow. And you want to make it look like you did this on purpose. So I have my Elliott Love grasses here that show the edge at this point. All right, and the other thing about edging is that you want to move your lawn away from the tree roots because in a competition for water, the tree will always win. 
So I use pine needles for mulching and I gather the pine needles from the street <laughs> and from a couple of places in my yard. So then I would come back uh, along here with the pine needle uh, mulch so that they it discourages the the grass from growing in. Um, and I and I make around around the yard once every three or four years. Um, not very often, um, but it, you know, want to make sure that it's easy to mow, and that that the ferns and the other plants have a chance to move out into the area that was lawn. And I have a lot of ferns, and most of these ferns are self-sown, but having ferns as edges is really handy because then when my husband mows, then it just goes right under the fern fronds and we don't have to worry about it. But I will say that when, you know, every couple of years I go through here and pull the grass out of the woods uh, so that it, it will um, stay clear of St. Augustine grass in the woods. And, and most of the fern here, most of the ferns here are net vein chain ferns. And I, again, I have an article on my, on my blog about that. And, the, and there are some cinnamon ferns. And here, this fern here is a royal fern. And I just posted a photo of my royal fern out by my front pond on Facebook the other day. All right, so when you remove the lawn by bringing back the edges like that, yeah, we had a built-in irrigation system. So what happened was what used to be the edge of the lawn and they had in-ground in -ground sprinkler heads no longer worked because it wasn't lawn anymore. So uh, my husband went in and he put, he put them up on um, pipes and changed the sprinkler heads so that it's a different sprinkler head that, that sprays out. Um, over the ferns and over the the low area. But if you have woods coming in here that's taking over, you don't want a tree right next to your sprinkler head because it's the roots are going to destroy the piping. So here's a, a water oak tree, here's a magnolia tree, um, and here's another oak tree over here. So those get dug out. They get dug out again every couple of years, every few years, so that they um, are removed. Just cutting them back doesn't work. They'll just grow back again and again. So you need to really dig them out. And what I do with a tree like this is a magnolia tree is that I would move it to someplace else. The water oaks, I don't care, but the magnolia, I will move to somewhere else or I will pot it up and save it for my chapter's uh, plant sale um, in the spring. So when you have a non-lawn landscape, <laughs> you need to adjust the irrigation. And this is... Um, a non-lawn landscape that is still being irrigated. And it's ridiculous that they would do this, that I mean, it'd be better to have a ratty lawn than to have red, red uh, mulch there that they sprinkle. And then even though they have weed barrier cloth there, it doesn't work and the weeds come up because they're irrigating the area. So you need to think about, uh, plan ahead for your non your non-lawn landscape and you would want to think about changing the the irrigation system and ir drip systems are are good for vegetables and they're good for um for establishment so if you're planting a whole bunch of new things and you want to make sure that it grows then you might want to put in a temporary drip or irrigation system so that it is easier for the irrigation to happen all right, so here's a story of a self-sown beautyberry fern, and, and it needed help. This is in 2013. All right, so here's the beautyberry, and here are water oaks around it, and, and another tree and some vines that are climbing around it. So I took them out, leaving just the ferns here. 
that year. The next year, it looked like that. Again, we've got the chain ferns. We've got royal fern and a cinnamon fern here. But look, look at the beauty berry. It's just beautiful, and it's blooming here. And and in 21, it looked like that. So it's a, it's a full-grown shrub now in the shade uh, with the ferns. And here is another trip that I'm making around the edge to remove even more lawn. And see this fern that's coming into the into the area so i left that but um this is how i've been reducing the lawn so my husband will have less and less to mow so there it was the next year and then several years later and by the way this is that shady triangle again here's the the magnolia that I planted there, and it's totally native now. So, doesn't everyone want to support Mother Nature? And here is the coral honeysuckle that is just a wonderful native plant. And I have one request for you. Um, Marjorie and I put together a 10-minute um, PowerPoint presentation that you can download from the Native Plant Society website. It's under resources under downloadable documents and it downloads as a PDF file. But if you open the PDF file, then you then it has a link to the PowerPoint. So this is actually a front yard in the villages. This is uh, Steve Turnipseed, if you know him. So this is the frog fruit and native hollies and all native yard in the villages and it's civilized and so even though it's an HOA that he um, he can uh, get away with it in in the villages and there are more and more people who are doing the same thing so that they do not have poisoned landscape in their yards so Thank you very much. This is my presentation and do do download that. Show it to people in your HOA, garden clubs, anybody you can talk to. Thank you, Jenny. That was great. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I lost my... There we go. Um, Delcy Rodriguez asked, how do you deal with the homeowners, like issues that, that come up with your homeowners associations? What is your recommendation? Well, for one thing, download my PowerPoint um, so that you can show them why native plants are important. But the other part is that you need to, in a homeowners association, situation make it look like you did this on purpose so that you would keep a civilized front yard that has a pathway through a meadow or it's got a bench under a shade tree or it's got bird feeders and uh, orchids or, or whatever that it shows that you that it's not just a pile of weeds and the other the other thing to do is there are several signs that are available. It says native yards um, bring this landscape to life that you can buy from the from the fan from the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. If you go on their website, you can buy. Uh, uh, they, I think they have at least one. I, they might have two now. Metal signs that you can buy that says. They're native yard. They're na this is a native yard and it supports wildlife. Yeah, and she was also commenting that they have a list of the shrubs that the only certain shrubs are allowed and that if you don't plant them, they will fine her. So um, she's saying it needs to be at the state level, but is there a way we can adjust? I think actually even Deborah might be 
don't doesn't your homeowners didn't you work with them deborah to change some specifications well there are there is a state law i can't cite it right now but um the problem is enforcement yeah and, it's the florida friendly law yes that, that that you cannot be prevented from having a florida friendly landscape but i, I totally um, agree with you the way to deal with your hoa is to make it look pretty and and then other people you can spread the word you know right you know, the outreach is real important because most people again are inculcated with you know let's have formal landscapes like the people in belfast castle so that you know you have topiary and things that are ridiculous as far as maintenance goes so um it's 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 a conundrum but the more of us that plant natives and the more of us who who are doing the habitat building in our yards the better it is and and actually i wrote an article in my blog a, a couple of months ago i've had some blowback um because i had made a comment um because a famous gardener said oh natives aren't that important and i disagreed with that and then people said i was a native plant nazi and that i should mind my own business and and so there there has been a lot of blowback from the um gardening community that grows those plants that sell in home depot and stuff like that that um you know it's a it's a profitable business and if people start planting natives and they don't have to buy plants every three months and so people can't make as much money and so it there is blowback and the that's a good industry. sign the spray industry is so big mm -hmm. Um, JF is saying that their problem is convincing the homeowners that um, because everyone wants color and flowers, and then it's very hard to find example pictures that do show lots of colors that are native plant lots. Um, yes and no. I mean, if you plant tropical sage it blooms all year round it, it's a beautiful red flower um, and you have a combination of different plants that they at times of the year so it'll take some planning and and the uh, the other thing is that trying to convince people that they shouldn't be poisoning <laughs> their lawns and that you know this is bad for us as well is that you know so i think it was um jane goodall who said who thought it was a good idea to poison our our landscapes and poison our crops um, Dan wants to know any recommendations for a few shade loving native plants. Uh, Craig Hugel has a really good book on shade plant shade natives for um, Florida. Um, there, there are a number of of good plants. Um, again, I like my ferns, um, but while the ferns don't bloom, they look good all year round. So, you know, um, so it's the leaf that's important and not the bloom. But there are a number of good shade plants. Um, and again, if you look at the, there's a plant database on a native plant society. So if you have an idea of a plant that you would want, you can look up what kind of moisture it needs and what kind of uh, shade or non-shade that it needs um, on each plant profile. And then also on each profile, there's a link to the fan website that lists the vendors who have it in stock. Good. And um, Lillian mentioned that she was able to change some of the homeowners' choice association choices by becoming a board member. So yeah, it's only people up there. I mean, it's it's not God, you know. <laughs> 
Delcy commented that marigolds are pretty when in bloom. Um, and Anne mentioned for recommendations, fire spike and That's fire, fire rush. Fire bush, on, fire bush. I think it might be fire bush. Yeah. And that the homeowner has no problem with that. And it is true that Delcy mentions that the fertilizers are poisoning the aquifer. And I think a lot of people, while they don't care about the plants and the birds and everything else, if you say, oh, you know, all this drains out to those manatees, usually they feel a little bit more, <coughs> they they like the manatees better. So they think about that. Right. So um, JF said, I should have clarified, I'm on our landscape committee. So I meant we're trying to convince the board to go Florida friendly and native as much as possible in common areas. Well, my, my comment about the Florida friendly program is that only half of the recommended plants are native. Um, and I would really like to see the Florida friendly program be augmented to be at least 75 percent native and, and they have things like perennial peanut on there is florida friendly but it's already escaped in more than 15 counties so i'm thinking that that is a possible invasive in the future because it is so um aggressive um so you know if you have natives then we, we, we eliminate that problem And I will have to say, we went out to California and you know how they don't have grass out there. The yards were all so beautiful. I mean, it wasn't even the right season. So some of this stuff was kind of dead, but it was like so nice to see a unique area. You know, it, when we plant the home, the big box store plants, they it, you can't tell where you are. In the I know US. it could be anywhere, Perks anywhere. Yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. Um, there in Alachua County, the county there was paying people to take out their yards, their lawns. Oh. Um, so the Department of Environmental Protection was actually um, paying some of the costs. They would split the cost with the homeowners to remove the lawn. That's forward thinking. And JF wanted to know if you have any thoughts on Lantana. Is it okay to use sterile varieties of native? Yeah, well, this even if it's sterile, um, if it's an invasive plant, it's still a problem. It may not produce berries, but it could cross pollinate with the other the other. Um, plants in the neighborhood that do have berries that could change the uh, or make those more successful even than then. Um, so there is a native lantana. There's native lantana. So stick with that. Okay. okay. Any other questions? I love that you plugged the homegrown national park. Yeah, well, it, it, it's interesting because it was actually uh, a woman who approached Doug, who organized the whole thing. She had recently retired and was looking for a project. And so she created the website and created the whole thing. And so he is the face, but she is the one that's behind it. And then there's another woman who's actually written, rewritten his books for kids. So it's I'm I'm very impressed that he is um, academia open to that. Yeah, he's open open to other people helping uh, his cause, and I think the homegrown national park is is a a wonderful concept. And it was somebody who had heard him speak and said, but you need action. You need, you can't just be talking about this. You need something that people can do. I think that's a good idea. That's very good. I still have to work on 50%. Mm -hmm. So we'll put the link to download that on on the YouTube channel 
when we post this and okay. uh, continue the education. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, yeah. again, th thanks so much for having me. I'm I'm a uh, I'm pleased to be able to do this and keep up the good work. Thank you. And JF also said how about bringing it into schools. Are there any official programs or ideas to do this? And Kathy, you work in the school, so maybe that. Would... Some schools are much more progressive than others with this. So. And I think I did go to the Green School Expo and Orange County is picking a school that they're going to try to switch over to natives. Oh, so, wow. We're going to do a makeover. That's really good. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Hopefully that will be a success. And if they can show the benefits, all other schools will do it. So That's right. Yeah. You've, you've got to get it started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Very true. All right. Well, we appreciate everyone coming and we look forward to next week. And everybody have some happy gardening. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Go out. And time of year. Not hot. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And there's a lot of native plant sales coming up. We'll have to post about Right. It. Yeah. There's um, the Lou Gardens one is early next month. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks again, Jenny. And thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.